Greetings, everybody. Welcome to another edition of Then, Now, and the Future. Um, and today, uh, we're going to talk about public speaking. Um, and this is particularly because that's what Marcus does. So um, without further ado, I'm just going to ask Marcus to sort of introduce us to this topic. Peter, thank you. And uh, uh, yeah, public speaking. <laughs> It's about communication, isn't it? It's about, you know, my entire career, I suppose, has been about communication. I started life as a journalist. I moved into a career in public relations. I now work as a life coach and a public speaking coach. So I guess my entire career has been based around communication. And speaking is something that we all do. But there's a Grand Canyon size gulf between being a talker and being a eloquent and yeah yeah i mean it sounds like you've you've really developed this skill over the years so perhaps you could help us telling how it all started when i was 11 years old i guess when i first went to uh, my senior school uh, i went to a comprehensive school in london called woodbury down comprehensive it was the first purpose built comprehensive school in london and once a week we would have an assembly of the entire school and that was about 1600 pupils and the assembly hall was like a, a huge theater with a balcony that ran three sides of the building that was tiered fixed tiered seating um, on the on the lower floor a big apron stage that jutted right out into the auditorium and on that stage would be the senior teachers and although it was a comprehensive school they'd all be capped and gowned there'd be the head boy and the head girl and there would be one pupil whose job it was um, to do a bible reading to the school and for some reason uh, the drama teacher who was tasked with organizing the kids who did the bible readings spotted me and included me in that group so i guess it was something like six months into my first year at secondary school i had to go up on that stage or be sat up on that stage in front of an audience of 1600 kids um, and do a bible reading and it was one of those very old very thick bibles on a big stand and I came up to about there uh, totally intimidating yeah so it sounds like a very impressive environment to be in a very large-scale performing environment to be in well as you know as your first effort at public speaking and in, in fairness um, the drama teacher uh, uh, a lady called Miss Davis who I had through my entire school career and who I absolutely idolized um, did give us coaching so uh, we'd be taken into the empty assembly hall and stood up on the stage and she would stand at the back of the hall and talk to us about projecting our voices and you know there's a difference between projecting and shouting um, telling us how to handle the audience and um, this might be of interest because it was advice and coaching that she gave to me when I was 11 years old it has stuck with me ever since the bible reading came after us you know a psalm um, so I'd have to walk up to the bible and she said to me Marcus everyone's just sung a psalm so what you do is this you wait until everyone has sat down you wait until everybody has settled and stopped shuffling around. You wait until they're looking at you and only you. And then and only then do you start speaking. And that took a lot because it feels like, you know, when you're stood up on this stage in front of this yes. huge audience, it feels like forever. You know, and, yes. You know, at what point do I think they're now all looking at me? Yeah. At what point should I start speaking? Yeah. And do we still live in a world where people would actually 
stop? I'm just wondering now. Well, you, you, you know what? It, that advice is as true now as it was then. I, uh, I do a lot of networking. I get the opportunity um, to do a lot of talks at those networking meetings. And a lot of those meetings are on Zoom. I stand up to do my talks. So, yeah, I come from the school of thought that says if you're a speaker, you stand to speak. Right. And it doesn't, and it doesn't matter whether you're on Zoom or whether you're in a face to face meeting. Okay. So even though we're on Zoom, I stand. OK. And when I'm introduced. I wait. Because you can see on the screen whether people are looking at you or not, or whether they're looking at their phones or whatever uh, it might be. Uh, uh, you know? uh. So that advice is as true now, and it's as true if we're on Zoom. I wait and I make sure that the people in that room, are, you know, because, because you don't start speaking straight away, everyone automatically looks up and go, oh, okay, what's going on? Why yeah, don't? okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, so how did your speaking career proceed from those early days uh not for a long time really I, I i took a severe knockback from my drama teacher um i used to go to her after school drama classes and i i, I was really into drama and i confided in her one day and said miss davis when i leave school i think i'd like to be an actor and she looked at me and she put her hand on my shoulder and she put her head to one side and as gently as she could, she said, Marcus, have you ever considered the civil service? Oh, there's a bit of a contrast there, isn't it? <laughs> so my 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 hopes uh, were, were somewhat dashed. And you know what? She wasn't far wrong. I, I left school and went into journalism and I had a career in journalism for you know local and national newspapers. Yeah. Um, you know, for about 12 years or so. But I did go into, I did move then into a career in public relations, and that career was in local government. Okay. So when I look back, I tend to think, you know what, maybe, maybe you know, maybe, maybe she wasn't that far wrong. It was a sort of hybrid, really, wasn't it? <laughs> yeah. I mean, it wasn't the sort of driest form of civil service. Yeah, and, I mean. and, it, and it was PR. Um, so I, I, I guess... My career has always been about communications, mm -hmm. um, you know, certainly initially sort of written communication. But the more I w worked in um, PR, I used to coach politicians and senior managers around media interviewing techniques. I used to coach them around sort of presentation skills. Yes. How, how do you take really quite complex subjects and simplify them so that you can present them in an interesting way uh, that, that, that people can grasp hold of. So I, I was moving gradually, I suppose, more into the, 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 the verbal communication side of things. Okay, so how did it become sort of full-blown public speaking, the kind of thing that you do now? Right, uh, so I, I took the opportunity to take voluntary redundancy from my local government job, uh, moved into a career um, in life coaching initially, and my wife and I went on a cruise. And on these cruise ships, they have huge theatres and they have guest speakers. And I said to my wife, I'm going to go and listen to this speaker. It's probably not the sort of thing you're interested in, but I'd, I'd just like to go and see how he does it. And this was a guy who'd worked for Interpol dealing with international drugs. Mm -hmm. And his material was really interesting, but the presentation was awful. It was death by PowerPoint. Mm -hmm. He stood hidden behind a podium and the theatre was packed. And people seem to love it. And I said to my wife, you know what? I'd love to do what he's just done. And you know what? I think I could do it as well, if not better than him. And I did a bit of research <clears throat> and uh, found out what the requirements were to be a speaker on a cruise ship. And I thought it wouldn't hurt for me to perhaps hone some of my speaking skills. So I did some more research about public speaking organisations and came across Toastmasters International, mm -hmm. found, <clears throat> excuse me, found a club uh, fairly near me 
joined and suddenly discovered that there was a whole bunch of stuff about public speaking that I didn't know I didn't know. You're right. So I've been a member now for seven, eight years. I have learned such a lot about public speaking. Mm -hmm. and those are skills that I then wanted to share with other people, certainly in my network. Yeah. Um, where I get the opportunity to see a lot of people doing uh, presentations. You get the opportunity to do 20 minute presentations at um, these uh, networking meetings. And a lot of them have really good content, but they just don't know how to present it. OK, well, we don't have a lot of time, Marcus, but I'm sure uh, listeners would be really interested if you could give just like one or two things that people really miss the, the sort of average lay person who said, oh, I'll give a presentation. What are the kind of things that they're, they're missing that would really um, spice up their talks? Oh, oh OK. Let me just say that on my uh, YouTube channel, which is yeah. Nervous Life Coaching, uh, I've got a series of... Right, okay, so just like a taste videos. of it. Um, yeah, but construction, you've got to have a great story, uh, you've got to have a great beginning, you've got to have some content in the middle that makes sense, and you've got to have a great ending, and you've got to connect the beginning and the end of that story. You need to take people on a journey. So right. that they feel like they've arrived somewhere. Um, you need to uh, vary your voice, voice variation. So many people just speak in a monotone. Okay. Mm -hmm. So you you need to use some voice variation. If you've um, if you've got something sort of a bit exciting to say, you might want to speed your voice up a little bit. If you've got something that's a bit more um, sensitive, you might just want to lower your voice. Um, okay. Use even if we're online on on Zoom. Use your screen um, as your stage. You could, yes. you know, um, like I said, I I stand up when I speak. But even if you're sat down, you know, move your chair back a bit so that your your face isn't. You know, so many people do their talks like this, and then you get these Kermit hands. Yes. Yes. So even if you don't want to stand up, you can move your move yourself back a bit further so we can see more of you um, yeah. and you can start incorporating a bit of body language uh, in, into what you're saying. Um, you know, so those are those are just a, a, you know, a, a, a few of the tips. But yeah, you know, don't don't wander into your talk. Don't you know, um, don't use PowerPoint. Don't share your screen unless it's absolutely integral to what you're saying, because at the end of the day, if you're giving a talk, yes. Although in our networking group the talks aren't supposed to be a sales pitch, they are because yes. you're selling yourself. Yes. It's your opportunity to demonstrate your expertise. So why hide behind a screen? Why hide behind PowerPoints? Let people see you. Okay, so you would say that just a person without visual aids is is ultimately the most powerful thing would you absolutely absolutely be for, for a whole bunch of reasons <laughs> firstly because most of the visual aids i see are totally useless they add absolutely nothing to the talk people are giving right they are a distraction because people will then read what's on the visual aid um and they stop listening to you Okay. And then they, you know, uh, and then they lose what you're saying completely. I see. Mm -hmm. And if all you're going to do is read what's already on the screen, yes. What's the point? Mm -hmm. You know. So this is an opportunity to sell yourself. So yeah, um, my my clients have to convince me that if they want to use those type of visual aids, that they're absolutely essential to the talk. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. So the power of the spoken word, you're a great advocate of that, yeah? Yeah, I, you know, we can achieve so much. We can paint. You've got the whole lexicon of the English language, you know, and you can paint such dramatic pictures. And isn't it great to enable people to use their imagination, to take mm -hmm. your words and then use their imagination to construct their own mental vision of what it is that you're talking yeah. about? 
Yeah. And what about attention span, you know, of an educated, healthy adult? I mean, you know, because we talked about 20 minute presentations. Um, is that the optimum length? I mean, if it's a very good speech, what's the range that we can talk about? <laughs> I don't think there is an optimum. I think it depends on uh, the audience and the circumstance. So uh, at our club, for example, yes. um, we work on two minute impromptu speeches without any preparation. You know, right. you know, I'll go to someone might say to me, OK, Marcus, come out the front and talk to us for two minutes about why you've always wanted to be an astronaut. Uh -huh. No, no preparation. So you've got a two minute talk. Um, most of our prepared speeches at club are five to seven minutes. Um, the present okay, so fairly short, in fact. So, yeah. Um, I mean, I mean, what my interest is the upper end of the scale. Okay. Because okay. So I know you, you might... can hold people's attention for a few minutes, but but when in all, what's the word? You know, in all reality, if you like, when and I want I've got something important to say. I've got very good content. Okay. And I've got a pretty good audience as well. You know, they're educated, they're very right. good so, people. So everything's at a fairly good level, optimum level. But even then, you know, the human nature is limited as to what people can absorb and when they're going to start drifting off. That's my question. How much, you know, what's the sort of almost like saying, what's the sort of maximum where you can still feel safe that the whole thing's going to go down well? I My talks to the Women's Institutes are an hour long. An hour? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so, like I said, I think it depends on what you've been asked to do. Right. <laughs> One of the very first WI talks that I did, um, the president, when she phoned me to book me, said, Marcus, um, we'd like you to talk to us for an hour and we expect to be entertained. <laughs> so no pressure there. Then. Right. Now, yeah. when you say an hour, that's before questions. That's an hour yeah. of you speaking. Yeah. Wow, that's that's pretty impressive, I have to say. If you can if you can hold people's attention for that long, yeah. But again, it depends on it depends on the content. So I do that without any visual aids. Yes, you know. Well, yeah, that's the other point with nothing, just just speaking. Yeah, um, but there's stories from my time in journalism. There's stories from my time uh, working in public relations. It's about involving the audience. It's about you know sort of. Uh, you know, who remembers Tim Bowles in front of the fire? And, you know, so people will put their hands up. And so it's about, you know, and it it's about working an audience. Part of it is about um, making eye contact with the audience so that, that you know, so, you know, I, I'll scan the room, I'll work the room, I make yes. sure I, I, I make eye contact. So people feel like you're talking to them. So it's about keeping people involved, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. having some sort of interaction. Of okay, so that's an interesting part of your, your longer talks. You will be getting people to almost chip in. I mean, are you asking them sometimes to actually say something more than, yes, I remember? I mean, is there, would, would you actually? Yeah, I, you know, I, 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 I might do so, you know, early into my talk I mean uh, I'm living in South Wales now so I'm talking yeah. to women's institutes in Wales and I'll I'll say to them you, you might notice from my accent that I'm I'm not Welsh I'm a Londoner anyone else here from, invariably someone yeah, okay what what part of London are you from oh right yeah you know okay. I'm okay. a north oh you're south of the river but you know south of the river is like a foreign country you know yeah, so yeah, you, yeah, have, yeah. you know so you have that sort of dialogue that sort of interaction yes yes, um, yes you know i in one of my jobs i i worked with ann robinson um you know who remembers ann robin you know or there was this you know journalist in the office and she was young and she smoked like a trooper and she drank like a trooper and she swore like a trooper anyone want to guess who she might be and people will throw out some names like, yeah you've got it ann robinson early you know scary lady even then you know, so it's about being up for it. It's about sounding enthusiastic. It's about involving your audience. Um, but, you know, um, one of my uh, Toastmasters colleagues for me to um, progress through my level had to come and, if you like, witness me doing a talk to an outside organisation. 
And he said, Marcus, I've seen you do that same talk uh, as a five minute talk, as a 20 minute presentation and as an hour long talk. So it's the same talk. Yeah, right. It's, it's about what you put in and what you leave out. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so. Right. OK, well, just to conclude, you want to tell where listeners can sort of find your tips, advice, guidance for, for these? Yeah, my YouTube channel. So if you go onto YouTube and you look for Novus Life Coaching, uh, that's my YouTube channel. And my top 10 speaking tips are uh, all there as short two or three minute individual videos. OK, so Novus Speaking, is that right? Uh, Novus Life Coaching. Oh, no, Novus Life Coaching. Okay. Yeah. So, N-O-V-U-S. Okay, so if people want to get Marcus's tips, that's the place to go. Well, thanks very much, Marcus. For me, that's been very interesting, a real eye-opener, and sort of slightly inspiring, maybe, you know, that, you know, perhaps I could have a look at this, how to how to speak, you know, yeah. you know, structure things and so well, on. Well, th thank you for the opportunity, Peter, and as always, it's been great fun. Yeah, great. Okay, well, we'll see you on the next edition and, and everybody else who cares to come along.